Okay, well, welcome everyone on behalf of the Tertulia organizers. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'll introduce us. My name is Christy Elaine. I'm from St. Thomas University and along with Tracy Glynn and Matthew Hayes, also from St. Thomas and Daniel Tubb from UNB. We want to welcome you to the first Tertulia of the winter schedule. Um, we're excited about the schedule. We've we've shifted a little bit this time to move from looking at big thinkers to big shakers. So we're, um, we're exploring uh, people and movements over the, over the winter and we think it'll be really exciting. So we hope you'll join us for, for these events. We wanna begin by acknowledging that the land we're on is the unceded territory of the Wistikwe people um, and that these territories are covered by the treaties of peace and friendship. We'd ask you to reflect on the colonial relations of power that structure access to these lands and think about our own practices of decolon uh, our own decolonizing practices. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors for tonight, the Tabique River Trading Company, Between the Lines Press, Fernwood Press, and of course the MB Media Co-op where we will uh, post a video of this presentation uh, in the coming days. We welcome your questions over the course of the evening and you can place them in the chat. And when um, Mary has done her presentation, Matthew will probably ask you to voice your question. And I think that's it with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Tracy to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, so it's, uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Mary McCarthy Brandt, uh, who is an Fredericton based activist, writer, and educator, uh, who is dedicated to preserving the histories of Black New Brunswickers. So a recent PhD graduate from the University of Toronto's Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, OISE. So very recent, uh, Mary defended in, um, in December, so Dr. Brandt, or sorry, Dr. McCarthy Brandt, uh, research is focused primarily on forgotten and segregated graveyards across New Brunswick. So, in, in addition to her scholarship, um, Mary also served as the uh, the president of the New Brunswick Black History Society for six years. Uh, in 2015, Mary won a human rights case against Shoppers Drug Mart for an incident of racial profiling that occurred in 2011 um, and, uh, and has spoken um, publicly about that. And I was, uh, uh, I was able to attend a talk by, by Mary about that at UMB a few years ago. Um, so Mary's work is featured in the 2019 collection, Black Writers Matter, that's edited by Whitney French. And so tonight, uh, Mary's going to be talking about Abraham uh, Beverly Walker, um, who was New Brunswick's first Black lawyer and a prominent activist and lecturer. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Mary. Thank you, uh, Tracy. And uh, I first just want to say thanks to uh, Tracy and everyone behind the scenes that invited me. Uh, I like to think that I kind of am a big thinker too, so I'm happy to join the club. Um, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introdu introduction. I will just add a bit that I am sixth generation African Canadian and, um, and I'm a local Fredericton lady. Um, my parents are both from this area and I grew up, uh, actually I spent my childhood years in the Woodstock area. So tonight I am going to talk about Abraham Beverly Walker. Uh, I will say that I probably will defer to calling him ABW because I've done that with the author who's become a dear, dear personal friend, Peter Little. Um, I'll just kind of show you the book. I don't know if anyone has purchased the book or has the book. It was uh, released, I think that's the word you say, with the, when a book is published. So it was um, available for purchase in uh, early November, late October of 2019. So the territorial acknowledgement has been done and I thank you for that. And a um, little repetition there, just talking, uh, showing you a bit about uh, Abraham and his life and the day he was born and his passing. 
And I wanted just to ask everyone uh, in the audience, uh, I don't know how many is there, I can only see about four or five people, but I want you to think about this question and uh, reflect on what comes to mind when you hear civil rights leaders. Um, and I'm just going to put some slides up to kind of jar your mind. So, of course, we all know uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We also know Rosa Parks, and I just noticed earlier today that Dr. King Jr. is behind her in that slide. Uh, we also know Canada's own Viola Desmond, who's now on our $10 bill. We're very proud of her. She's from Atlanta, Canada, from Nova Scotia. And closer to home, there is Clifford Skinner and Lena O'Ree. And Clifford Skinner was very instrumental in the 60s and 70s. He started Prude, one of the main food finders, NAACP. And I don't know if anyone knows about Lena O'Ree, but she was very significant too as a a civil rights leader and she kind of desegregated like a, a cinema here uh, in St. John. So two very prominent um, civil rights leaders in, uh, in, in New Brunswick. But today we're gonna focus on ABW. And I will say that I was thinking today as I was tidying up the slides that the first time I ever heard of uh, ABW uh, was in the early 2000s when I saw a tapestry at St. Thomas. The St. Thomas staff will know about the nine tapestries that celebrate uh, the stages and the hist chronologically the Black history in New Brunswick. And it starts with like 1792. And so there is a, a tapestry that is shared by uh, Matilda Winslow, uh, Abraham Beverly Walker, and uh, Arthur Henderson, who are prominent Black figures in the late uh, 18th century. So that's my first recognition or, or recollection of ever knowing about ABW. I show these slides because that just, I want people to be aware of the um, climate that ABW was born into. Um, these slides were in the St. John paper and apparently this man, Titus Knapp was a horrible man. He was a slave trader and a slave catcher. And um, as well as um, James Hyatt, they both ran ads to try to collect individuals of African descent and take them back and sell them back to the USA for the to promote and continue the institution of slavery. So this slide, uh, if everyone can see, the very fat blue arrow is where ABW was born. It's called Jenkins Corner or Jenkins Cove in Cars, New Brunswick. Uh, that's uh, very close to the St. John area. And the smaller arrow is where he went to school. He attended uh, a one-room schoolhouse there in Cars, and I believe he went from grades one to six. Um, and ABW was born in 1851, which I've mentioned before, but um, so that's his birthplace. So the next slide is uh, Reverend William Elias Scoville. He's instrumental in uh, ABW's life because he taught him uh, roughly between grades seven and 12. He was a priest of an Anglican church and Scoville is very um, instrumental and important in ABW's life because Scoville developed a very unique form of shorthand and ABW was a master and a whiz at that. So. Um, Scoville is important in ABW's growth as a, uh, as a young man, and as he sought employment, he was um, able to use these shorthand skills. It's important to say that uh, the Scoville's um, shorthand, um, he was able to uh, produce a book, a textbook, and that book is available in the Provincial Archives in Fredericton. And it's, again, Scoville's own, own brand, I guess, of shorthand. Um, 
And again, ABW was quite a master of that. So uh, this slide speaks to um, a church that um, ABW had attended. He, uh, this church was very instrumental. It's not even standing now, but there was a great fire in St. John, um, New Brunswick in 1877. And this is one of the few surviving structures. And it is an Anglican church that um, ABW attended with his family. And my next slide is uh, one of uh, ABW's first employer. His name is um, Orson Squire Fowler. And he developed this phrenologist type of theory. <laughs> um, so when ABW left school, this was his first employment and he worked quite closely with Mr. Fowler. Anyone heard of the phrenologist? I hadn't even heard of it. I guess I shouldn't ask questions in the middle of my talk. We can chat later, but uh, it was quite uh, an education to, to read ABW's story. The next slide is um, uh, the Ritchie Building, which was the site of ABW's first law office. Uh, Abraham uh, got his law degree in 1881 from the National University in Washington. He had his first office in this building. He, as I said, he received his law degree 1881 and he was admitted to the bar in 1882. And what's kind of interesting is that this building, the Ritchie building in St. John had several lawyers uh, offices in this building. So moving on, uh, the next gentleman I'm going to talk about is Clifford Sifton. He was uh, not very positive in ABW's life. Um, twice in ABW's life, he tried to get a QC designation as a lawyer. And the first time he tried was in the 1880s, like 18, you know, probably 82 to 85. And, and um, all the local lawyers riled up against him and said they would walk away if a black man was appointed a QC. So um, ABW let that flow for a bit. And then he um, appealed to um, the prime minister at the time, Wilford Laurier, and asked to have uh, his QC status, asked to have it uh, promoted or received. And um, this man, Clifford Sifton, was very instrumental in talking Wilford Laurier out of it. So the second time he was denied a QC designation. Next, uh, from the archives, we have a letter from ABW. And he, had, he was struggling to keep his office going, struggling, struggling to work. So he, um, Abraham wrote a letter to uh, Lieutenant Governor Wilma and he applied for a chief uh, court stenographer position, probably to use his excellent shorthand skills. Um, again, this was in 1885 and he was denied the position. Now, ABW uh, was very much uh, uh, a pro-black man. He did not, he did not like, he did not, he couldn't take, he couldn't, uh, he did not respect anyone who made fun of the black race. He lashed out uh, at anyone. So I, I show these two brothers, James and George Bohe, who were very famous minstrel brothers. And they even played in front of King Edward VII. They traveled all over the world. They're originally from St. John. James was born in 1844 to 1897. George was born from 1857 to 1930. They eventually moved to the States and then to England teaching banjo. But why they're included is that some of their songs were uh, de making fun of themselves, making fun of the black race. And ABW would not tolerate that. He could not tolerate anyone putting down the black race. And so I just wanna talk some general facts as to the brilliance of ABW. Um, so he was very much um, 
a writer and a deep thinker. Um, you know, his book says lawyer, lecturer, activist. And I guess so much in his activist role, he, he was called upon by the, um, by the press. Uh, he also wrote a six part series for the St. John uh, paper, The Globe. Um, as I said, he spoke out strongly against musicians that made fun of themselves or our race. Uh, he certainly couldn't handle, like at that time, there was the blackface minstrels, and he could not take that. Um, and uh, yeah, so he just he just was a very strong, proud man, and and pushed his his uh, integrity and the strength of of his race at the time. He demanded the respect that he felt that uh, that we were all entitled to at that time, and and today, of course. Uh, the next slide is uh, the law school, which uh, was established in 1892, part of King's College. And um, ABW, he was such an educated man uh, and seeking always education. He was the first person of anyone to sign up for that, uh, to just to take additional courses. He already was a lawyer, but he, um, he wanted to, um, learn more and be further educated. Um, and so uh, he was the first person of any color to be signed to this law school in St. John, certainly the first black man. Uh, and this course, and this course, this slide um, is uh, the courthouse in Hampton. And uh, this is included because um, there was uh, a specific court case it talks about in the book that ABW was in a debate with another lawyer. And this was um, a particular civil trial and the conversation basically said, um, the gentleman said, why should I have to debate against a black man? He's not even a full person. And so then ABW said, your honor, you know, um, this man, you know, is, is so, you know, ridiculous and hateful. He would be, he would, wouldn't even attend my funeral if I passed away. And then the man said, oh yes, I would be glad to attend your funeral if you passed away. So this is just the, the type of environment and frustration that and insulting behavior that ABW faced as he plowed through his career as a lawyer uh, in uh, the uh, 18, late 1800s. Now, as I said, ABW was a very prolific writer and he used to give his talks and then he would uh, somehow reproduce them and sell them uh, after the talk. So this is just uh, something from the archives. And, and again, I got my research from the author, Peter Little, and he says that this is on file at the um, Acadia University archives. So he would have a flyer advertising, advertising his talk. He would do his lecture and then he would have pamphlets of his talk to sell as people were leaving. So quite a businessman and a marketing mind. This man, uh, Henry Michael Turner, was very involved in the African civilization movement. This was a global movement and uh, I include him because in 1905 ABW um, started a chapter in St. John. Um, what's of interest is that Reverend Turner took around 500 people uh, in the, uh, I think it was around 1870 to, um, I think it was Liberia. And he took them because everyone who was living here or living in the US and were descendants of slavery wanted to have their own country. I, I'm assuming I, that wasn't exactly written, but he, he did have this movement and um, much like Thomas Peters did here in New Brunswick, he, he uh, took a group of people to Sierra Leone. Anyway, um, Reverend Turner took 500 people and it did not, it was not a very successful trip. They arrived, but they did not stay and they eventually came back. But that did not deter ABW. He started his own chapter here in St. John and he was very much in favor of a movement to, to Africa. 
so this is another church. This is um, another Anglican church where they had, uh, I guess, a, a social night. And what happened in the social night, 1897, was there was a variety show and there was uh, a very violent poem and skit made. And uh, they used the N-word quite prolific. And um, ABW was very, very upset and challenged everyone. He could not take, nor can I, <laughs> not that I'm even to his level, but any type of, of stereotyping and mimicking of, of our Black race and the use of the N-word. So that is why this slide is included. So ABW, again, as an educator, he started the first Black magazine called Neath. Um, it was uh, established in St. John, and Neath is an Egyptian word, which means a goddess of birth. I googled it the other night, and it means goddess of birth, goddess of power, one who controls over. So a very uh, beautiful, short, five-letter word with multiple meanings and uh, um, so this was uh, Abraham Beverly Walker's first magazine. And um, you probably can't see that, but there were a lot of very prolific people who submitted and a lot of prolific uh, white individuals, uh, people of European descent, uh, like for instance, the Honorable H.A. McKean, he submitted an article and he was an MLA and a chief justice in 1908. W. O. Raymond, uh, historians out there, you would know him. He has submitted articles to this meet. And uh, the magazine was kind of split, uh, you know, between, it was about 60 pages, quite uh, an endeavor. And 50% was on race and the other was mixed with kind of philosophy, history and uh, literary politics. The next slide is ABW's son, George Walker. He was uh, a clone after his dad, very, very prolific. Um, as, as I said, ABW pushed, pushed education and pushed his family for higher education. And um, this is his son uh, who has written lots and who also um, wrote articles for me was also a minister, a preacher in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME. And as well, George spoke seven languages. This is just a picture of George's church in Yarmouth at the Yarmouth AME, Reverend George Walker. And this is uh, the church where ABW's funeral was held. ABW passed away in 1909. And this is St. Luke's uh, or St. Jude's Anglican Church in St. John West. Now, I don't know if you can see on this slide, there is a stick with a little red mark on it. And that is the grave of A.B. Walker. There is no stone and uh, there he is located again at the Trinity Church Cemetery in St. John. So I'm winding down. Uh, so in 2019, uh, Peter Little, the author, was able to apply and be successful in getting an Order of New Brunswick posthumously for ABW. And so that happened in the fall of 2019 actually almost the same time that uh, maybe a few weeks before then the book came out. And there is Mr. Little with the um, uh, Lieutenant Governor um, receiving the actual medal for the Order of New Brunswick. And what was so beautiful is that his family, Peter was able to reach his family I just have so much respect for this man and for his family. So his uh, great gr great grandson and great granddaughter were able to come to the uh, to the event, and they said, "No, Peter, you accept it on ABW's behalf, but we will be there to support you." So that happened in the fall of 2019. And so my last slide is just a quote of ABW's. And he said, a man should not be measured by his race or his color or his creed, but by the size of his soul 
or his heart or his mind. And that is my presentation, everyone. Thank you very much, Mary Louise. You are welcome. Fantastic.